uh, Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming. Uh, for those of you who have spent any time in the water this summer, you may have noticed that it was warmer than usual. On the East Coast, typically chilly Maine beaches felt more like those usually found in Maryland, which were in turn feeling more like Florida. Worldwide ocean temperatures in July were the hottest recorded in the last 130 years. While this might benefit your beach weekend now, it is the latest reminder of the serious consequences of global warming. As the oceans warm and become more acidic due to increasing absorption of carbon dioxide, coral reefs and other critical components of the ocean ecosystem are put at risk, threatening food supplies for a significant portion of the world. Global warming is a global problem in need of a global solution. <clears throat> the next opportunity to find that global solution is coming quickly. In December, the nations of the world will gather in Copenhagen, intent on finalizing an international climate agreement that will protect people and the planet and unleash a clean energy revolution. Todd Stern, the United States Special Envoy for Climate Change, is with us today to report on the progress made thus far and the challenges that remain to reaching an agreement in Copenhagen. Since the start <clears throat> of the Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming, I have maintained that the most effective way of advancing the negotiations of the next International Climate Change Agreement would be for the United States to show leadership by committing to mandatory domestic reductions of heat trapping pollution. In June, the House of Representatives took the first step by passing the Waxman-Markey American Clean Energy and Security Act. To the rest of the world, House passage of this bill signaled America's growing commitment to preventing climate change and building a global clean energy economy. It helped leaders at the G8 and the major economies forum held in Italy this July reach agreement on important points, including the need for emissions to peak as soon as possible, commitments to prepare low carbon growth plans, and a pledge by developing uh, countries to take actions that would meaningfully reduce their emissions uh, from their current trajectories. <clears throat> I look forward to working with my Senate colleagues uh, so that we can send the strongest possible signal from the United States Congress to the, nego to the negotiations in Copenhagen. Sending clean energy legislation that reduces global warming pollution to President Obama is not just important for international diplomacy. It is critical to our national interest. The great race of the 21st century will be to provide affordable clean energy to the world. Whether countries are trying to revitalize flagging economies or pull their people out of poverty, they are turning to clean energy technology. In a race that the United States once had a clear lead, we are now falling behind. The Europeans, Japanese, and increasingly Chinese are using their domestic policies to drive the development of clean energy industries and stake their claims to the burgeoning global clean energy economy. If we want to be globally competitive, we must do the same. The United States' effort to reverse the trend began with the 2007 energy bill's increase in fuel economy standards and commitment to renewable fuels. It accelerated with the $80 billion investment in clean energy infrastructure and technology in this year's Recovery Act. It will culminate with a comprehensive clean energy law like the Waxman-Markey legislation that passed the House this summer. The world is watching in the United States. Uh, we should be responding to that concern the world has. It is time to reclaim our technical leadership on clean energy, our economic leadership uh, in the next great global jobs race, and our moral leadership to protect the planet. I am confident that this is the foundation upon which a new global climate agreement, one that includes all countries doing their fair share, will be built. 
I would now like to turn and recognize the uh, ranking member, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Well, I certainly thank the chairman from Massachusetts uh, for recog me, recognizing me. Uh, what I'd like to tell him is that uh, in the upper Midwest, we had a very cool and dry summer, and I live on a lake during the summer, and um, had you come and visited me, I could have posted a picture on the screen of you jumping in my lake and turning blue. So, uh, you know, I appreciate the world view that the gentleman from Massachusetts has got, but remember, the upper Midwest in the United States of America is part of the world as well. I'd like to join Chairman Markey in welcoming Todd Stern, the U.S. Special Envoy for Climate Change, to this hearing. We have 87 calendar days and 16 official negotiating days before the Copenhagen Conference on December 7th, when delegates hope to replace the flawed Kyoto Protocol. And where are we on the road to Copenhagen? Are we working toward success, or are we working, as I fear, toward a repeat of the Kyoto experience? After 26 days of negotiations at three meetings this year in Bonn, we are, in my opinion, a long ways from success. There are two parallel negotiations underway, one under the Convention, where the U.S. participates, and the other under the Kyoto Protocol, where the U.S. is an observer. The upcoming two-week negotiating session in Bangkok will start with well over 400 pages of text to consider. This compares with a little over 100 pages of text at a similar time in the 1997 Kyoto negotiations. In addition to having to wade through lengthy and complex negotiating texts, there are irreconcilable differences in the positions of developed and developing countries on a number of thorny issues, particularly on funding, technology, and midterm mitigation targets. Developing countries are demanding that developed countries contribute up to 1 percent of their gross domestic product to developing countries for climate change over and above existing foreign aid. This would be an additional tab of more than $140 billion a year for the U.S. alone. This is an unacceptable price tag for the beleaguered American taxpayer and will increase an already out-of-control federal budget deficit. Many developing countries have said they won't sign any agreement that does not include massive transfers of wealth. These same countries refuse to consider any binding commitments to reduce emissions. Developing countries are also leading efforts to weaken or even destroy intellectual property rights by seeking to gain free access to American and other developed countries' IPR for clean energy technologies. Their proposals include preventing patenting in developing countries, requiring compulsory licensing, and ensuring access to new technologies on a non-exclusive royalty-free term, all of which ignore the fact that new technologies will only be developed if there are incentives to create them. Developing countries have also demanded that developed countries reduce their emissions by at least 40 percent below 1990 levels by 2020. Cuts of such magnitude could only be achieved by wrecking developed countries' economies and, indeed, the global economy. In the meantime, most developing countries say they are unwilling to undertake any emissions reduction efforts in the absence of developed country funding or free technology. Finally, it appears that a majority of the developed countries, including the United States, have agreed that developing countries should not have to take on legally binding emissions reduction commissions in co commitments for the foreseeable future. Business as usual projections show that even if developed countries reduce their emissions to zero, global emissions will be higher in 2050 than they are today because of increases in the developing world. As today's witness told the Center for American Progress in June, quote, according to recent modeling, even if every other country in the world besides China reduced its emissions by 80 percent between now and 2050, a thoroughly unrealistic assumption, by the way, China's emissions would alone be so large to put us on a track to global concentrations, far above what scientists consider to be safe, unquote, from Mr. Stern. In light of this, will the Senate ratify an agreement that lets China, India, Brazil, and other major developing economies off the hook indefinitely? I have my doubts. So what does all this portend? 
And my more than 12 years experience with international climate change negotiations tells me that we're heading toward a repeat of Kyoto, namely an environmentally ineffective agreement that cannot be ratified by the United States Senate. With so many controversial issues left unresolved, Mr. Stern and his negotiating team has 70, or excuse me, 87 days of hard work ahead. I hope today's hearing helps provide a roadmap for a successful treaty that the American public and thus their elected members of the Senate can support. Thank you. The gentleman's time has uh, expired. We will now turn and recognize the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, continuing your weather dialogue here, I, it, uh, we just finished experiencing uh, the longest period in our, in our community's history, Oregon, uh, Portland, Oregon, known for rain, without rain this summer, uh, entirely consistent with what the experts would tell us in terms of changes in global uh, climate patterns. Uh, I'm very pleased that you've uh, structured this hearing today. I hear my good friend from Wisconsin. Uh, articulate the concerns about nation stated negotiating positions. After our work over the course of the last year, I am struck by the growing consensus about the shared interests that we all share, the opportunities to blend the range of interests, to be able to make sure that every country, uh, not so much their stated negotiating positions, but what is in their long-term interests and what we can do to fashion an agreement, uh, I think uh, is more possible than I would have expected. Um, it's clear that the Americans can no longer continue to waste more energy than anybody in the world, regardless of our concerns about climate change in these negotiations. But I look forward to hearing from Mr. Stern about how these pieces are coming together, what he views as the opportunities for these aligned interests, and last but by no means least, any observations that he may have about what we in Congress and this committee in particular can do between now and December to help move this along in Congress and any assistance we might be able to give in Copenhagen. Thank you very much. Great, hey, gentlemen, time has expired. The chair recognizes the general lady from West Virginia, Ms. Capita. Thank you. I, I too welcome the witness, Mr. Stern. I, just to make you familiar with me, the state that I represent, I represent West Virginia, which has a great uh, stake in, in uh, the decisions that you're making on the international stage. Um, it is always difficult in our state and has been historically to balance uh, the economic and environmental considerations. So I would ask you to, and I'm certain that you will take that into consideration a state such as mine, and they're so more heavily impacted than others uh, in this country to the decisions that, that are going to be made on the behalf of the United States uh, in the international community, and look not just at the environmental, but the, uh, the potential uh, economic impact that these decisions will, will make. Thank you. Great, General Ladies, time has expired. The Chair recognizes gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Well, continuing our reports of this summer, let me give you mine during my three-day summer vacation at Lake Quinault, Washington, it's on the Olympic Peninsula, part of the Olympic National Park. On the south side of Lake Quinault, there are these incredibly you know, huge trees, the tallest Sitka spruce in the world, the tallest Douglas fir tree in the world. But on the western ridge of every ridge that's exposed to the winds coming in from the Pacific Ocean, they looked like they'd been clear cut because there was an enormous windstorm that knocked down thousand year old trees in huge, you know, 10, 20, 30 acre patches on the western ridge. These trees have been around 500, 1,000 years, but now something's changing to knock them over. And it was, to me, it was a pretty powerful statement about what happens when the climate changes to have to be climbing over uh, these, these huge trees that have been knocked down. Now, I don't know if that windstorm specifically was caused by climate change, but it's consistent with what the pattern suggests is going to become more frequent and we're seeing become more frequent in the Pacific Northwest. Two notes of optimism. While this summer technology has been advancing, which ought to give us more optimism. Ultimately, we've got to have technology to solve this. Uh, last week, First Solar, an American company, just signed a contract to, to build the biggest solar electrical generating plant in China using American technology. This is a model for the future. We're going to be start building lithium ion batteries in this country and electric cars in this country. Technology should be giving us optimism in Copenhagen. 
And uh, second, there should be optimism in the U.S. Senate. We went over and talked to 14 sort of moderate Democrats a few weeks ago, and something happened that has never happened in the history of the U.S. Congress. Members of the U.S. Senate listened to members of the U.S. House <laughs> and actually took notes. I was stunned. This has never happened. There are, is a wonderful opportunity for America to lead the world, both in Washington, D.C. and Copenhagen. And Mr. Stern, we wish you well. Thank you. Uh, chair now turns and recognizes the gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Stern, welcome. We are delighted that you are here. I will have to uh, say that while I did not have a vacation, I had a workation in my district, but that in Tennessee, where I am from, as I was holding town halls, what we found was the weather was much cooler than average. And one of my town halls that had five times as many people as expected, we were too large for the building and found ourselves out on the parking lot the first week of August during the evening. And we were perfectly comfortable. It wasn't 103. It was more like 83 degrees. So uh, that came a little bit as a pleasant surprise for us. And when it was August 30th and I was slipping a sweater on my 15-month grandson to go out in the evening, I thought, my goodness, this really is the coolest summer that we have had in 113 years. But we welcome you. We are looking forward to hearing what you have to say. I'll have to tell you, while some of my colleagues favor a global treaty, I do not favor a global climate change treaty. And it's an effort that I am I'm not able to support. I've, as I've studied the issue and realizing that many third world nations um, are beginning to say, look, we need to be working on a standard of living. Their people and their leaders are trying to figure out how they deal with immediate real life and death issues every single day. Uh, and they are worried about food and health and uh, sustainable economic development and want to place those issues first and foremost before looking at climate issues that would have an effect on them 50 or 100 years down the road. And I think that we need to be, we need to be mindful of that. Another uh, item, technology. Mr. Inslee mentioned technology. And of course, we know much of the innovation in technology that has taken place has taken place here in this country. Uh, intellectual property protections for those innovators are going to be an imperative. But looking forward to the discussion today, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much. Great. Thank the gentlelady. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as we move toward uh, Copen Copenhagen, uh, I uh, personally uh, am experiencing a great delight uh, because uh, I think that with the United States uh, fully participating and with uh, the United States uh, for the first time putting forth an effort to deal with uh, one of the uh, uh, most difficult issues facing uh, our generation, uh, climate change, uh, the rest of the world, uh, I think, will take note, uh, pay attention, and, and even begin to uh, participate. Uh, I think that uh, when you look at uh, what, what is going on around the world, uh, uh, not uh, ignoring even here in the United, United States, uh, there is something that uh, I think should send chills through uh, most observant people who are not ideologically opposed to dealing with this crisis. And so uh, I am excited about the fact that this administration uh, will be fully uh, participating. I am excited about the fact that this committee, uh, led by you, Mr. Chairman, uh, has uh, provided uh, information to Congress, and uh, I think we uh, are on the road uh, to the beginning of the healing uh, of this planet. And so I uh, appreciate uh, your leadership and hope that uh, you will uh, go to Copenhagen and that I will be with you. you I yield back the balance of my time. We will go to um, Copenhagen together. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> now, I think we have completed all time for opening statements by members. <clears throat> so we will turn now to our witness, Mr. Todd Stern, who served in the White House from 1993 to 1999 and from 1997 to 1999, 
coordinated the Clinton administration's uh, initiative on global climate change. Uh, Mr. Stern served as the senior White House negotiator at the Kyoto and Buenos Aires negotiations. Uh, he has now been named by Secretary Hillary Clinton as the Department of State's Special Envoy for Climate Change. Uh, Mr. Stern is the Nation's Chief Climate Negotiator. He represents the United States internationally in all bilateral and multilateral negotiations regarding climate change. It is an honor for us to have you with us today. Mr. Stern, uh, whenever you feel comfortable, please begin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I should say that I spent many of my summers up in places like Eagle River, uh, Eau Claire, and Lake Nebagam in Wisconsin, up in those upper reaches where Mr. Sensenbrenner was talking about, but I am not going to get into the issue of where the water is hot or cold right now. Uh, I do thank you and the ranking member and members of this committee for inviting me here today, and let me thank you all for the hard work and leadership that you have shown over the past year. Uh, this morning I would like to provide you with a brief update on the state of negotiations. Uh, the core issues remain uh, mitigation undertakings for developed and, devel and the more advanced developing countries, a regime for measuring, reporting, and most importantly verifying all actions taken, and the provision of appropriate financial and technology assistance by major economies as well as uh, issues of adaptation and forestry. We are concentrating our efforts on three related fronts, uh, the formal negotiating track uh, of the U.N. Framework Convention, the major economies forum, and uh, bilateral discussions. Uh, let me say bluntly that the tenor of negotiations in the formal U.N. track has been difficult so far. Developing countries tend to see a problem not of their own making that they are at being asked to fix in ways which they fear could stifle their own ability to lift their standards of living. Developed countries tend to see an unforgiving problem that cannot be solved without the full participation of key developing countries, particularly China and other emerging market economies. And yet we must find a way to bridge this historic developed and developing country divide. In the Major Economies Forum, some good progress has been made. The Leaders' Declaration uh, in L'Aquila, Italy, included a pledge by developing countries to undertake actions that would significantly cut their emissions in the midterm compared to business as usual. The recognition of the broad scientific understanding that the increase in global temperatures ought not to exceed 2 degrees centigrade as compared to pre-industrial levels an agreement that emissions uh, globally must peak as soon as possible, and agreement on broad principles of financing related to climate change. And major developing countries, and that includes uh, China, Brazil, India, South Africa, are in fact uh, taking action. They have recognized the seriousness of the problem, their own vulnerability. That should be drawn from the Kyoto experience. Uh, certainly, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think first and foremost, uh, I would say that, uh, that Kyoto took place in what was fundamentally a domestic policy vacuum. Uh, it is critical that what we do internationally be synced up to what we are doing domestically, that there be political support uh, and support here in the Congress for the kinds of actions that we are talking about uh, taking internationally. So, that was, was vividly not true during the Kyoto year, years. It must be true now, and that, again, is one of the reasons why the Waxman-Markey legislation is so fundamentally important. Uh, second lesson is that we cannot, we cannot uh, move forward on an agreement which, which fails to include the major emitting countries in the world, whether they are developing or developed. Uh, the, the problem is, is, a, is a global problem that can't begin to be solved without the genuine uh, participation <coughs> of countries like China and the other emerging markets. They, the, you know, the, the, the reality is that the United States and the developed countries are the, are, the, are the big historic emitters, the United States the largest of all. But going forward, the, the vast majority of the growth in emissions is coming from the developing world, and they have got to play a, a, a significant part. So how will in your opinion, I'm sorry. How how will uh, successful negotiations in Copenhagen help American interests? Uh, 
uh, if you could talk about that in the context of the Waxman Markey legislation and what the benefits for our people uh, sure. would be. Well, I, I think I think there's uh, I think there's a few things to be said. First of all, uh, the, the climate change threat is is a fundamental threat to uh, to the United States as well as to other countries, and that's true as a matter of uh, economics, national security, and the environment. All three of those, and and uh, and not at all least from a from a perspective of national security, which has been uh, uh, highlighted in uh, in recent years and important report uh, by uh, Admiral, former uh, admirals and generals. It was put out by the CNA Corporation. Uh, there was a big front page story in the New York Times just a month or two ago uh, about this, and there's increasing uh, focus within uh, the national security community on this issue. Um, uh, it, it is also true that as a, that as a matter of, uh, of uh, the, the capacity to solve the problem. It's a global problem. So that if United States, the United States is a is a large emitter, but 80 percent of the problem takes place outside of the United States. So for us to act without action around the world, there's there's not a, there's no way to uh, to solve the problem. And uh, and uh, further, I think it's it is uh, it it will be in the. I mean, I I completely agree with what you said. When you said that that uh, you referred to a great race uh, in the 21st century uh, with respect to uh, clean energy and the development of clean energy, I think that's got the potential to be the economic driver for all of us, and to, including the whole world, not just the United States, but places that can be the recipient of United States uh, uh, high-tech exports, is clearly in the in the interest of of this country. If we could, it, it would help if you could talk a little bit about the United States-China relationship, um, the issues of clean energy and climate, uh, and the bilateral negotiations that have been going on in terms of using that as an indicator of the progress that uh, has been made uh, uh, towards um, an agreement. Right. Um Look, the United States and China are the two biggest players here. I mean, if there are two 800-pound gorillas in, on this issue, it's the U.S. and China re represent over 40 percent of global emissions. So uh, there is no question that we can't get an agreement that we can that is uh, acceptable uh, to us without uh, the genuine uh, participation of China. We have been uh, intensively engaged with with the Chinese at various levels, bilaterally in the major economies forum and other places. Uh, we have made it quite clear uh, to the Chinese uh, the kinds of things that 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 uh, that we need, which I reference in my testimony. They're going to have to take action, which is commensurate with uh, with the scope of the problem, with their role as uh, as now the largest emitter. Uh, they're going to have to reflect that action in an international uh, context. Uh, they're going to have to be uh, prepared to have a strong verification regime and the like. These are all issues that we, that we discuss with them. We are attempting to narrow differences. Um, the, you know, the, uh, the but part, of the, part of what is important, I think, with respect to China and other countries as well, but we're focusing on China now, is that this issue has to be seen, and I think that we have actually done a good job in, uh, in conveying this in, in a whole uh, array of different uh, uh, situations, starting with Secretary Clinton's uh, trip in February, uh, they have to see that this is a centrally important issue to the U.S.-China bilateral relationship. They care a lot about that. The, the, the summit that's going to occur uh, in November between President Hu and President Obama is probably going to be the biggest diplomatic event of the year for China. They do not want this to run off the rails. On the other hand, they are uh, in, in, in all things, tough negotiators, and are going to try to uh, going to try to get what's uh, what they see as most in their interest. But they, I I do think China wants to get a deal done. The question is going to be whether we can get the particulars put together in a way that works for them and for us. My time has expired. We recognize now the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, historically, climate treaties such as the UN, FCCC, and Kyoto have been submitted to the Senate as treaties. A Senate report prior to Kyoto stated that, in the view of the Foreign Relations Committee, any amendment to the convention that adopted emissions target would have to be submitted to the Senate. 
Uh, will the administration treat a Copenhagen climate deal if one is reached as an Article II treaty requiring advice and consent by two-thirds of the Senate, or will the administration say that this is a congressional executive agreement that would simply need a majority vote in both houses? Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Senator Brent, it's certainly our, uh, our expectation that, uh, that an agreement would be, would be uh, submitted to the Senate. I mean, we don't have any other plan at this point. That's, that's good to hear. Now, uh, the conundrum, of course, is that uh, developing countries, and led by China and India, uh, have uh, adamantly uh, objected to any type of binding, legally binding commission, uh, emissions cap in a treaty. And when you talked in June to the Climate Action Symposium, uh, you started looking at the math of the increasing growth of admissions in China and India, uh, coupled with the targets that are being uh, proposed for the developed world, and you call this the unforgiving math of accumulating emissions. Your words, not mine. Uh, in light of this unforgiving math, would you agree to a treaty that did not include binding commitments from developing <coughs> countries, particularly China and India? We have, uh, Mr. Chairman, we have, uh, in our submission, we've called for binding, uh, for binding commitments by, uh, by all the major players, uh, and, that's what we're, and that's what we're seeking. Uh, I mean, it, it, it is, uh, in, in our view, uh, understandable and, uh, uh, and appropriate, really, that there be differences uh, as between uh, what uh, what the developed countries are doing and what developing countries are doing with respect to the actual content of actions. And I think that's, that those are differences that, that ought to disappear over time. But we still recognize that there's, that there's some basis for difference. Well, the, the Bali Agreement, which was uh, negotiated by the Bush administration, did talk about differentiated commitments. I guess my question is, is that, that if China and India stonewall on the issue of binding commitments, is that a deal breaker that you and the administration would be willing to walk away from? No, I, well, that, that's what I was just—I was just—I was just getting to that, uh, uh, Mr. Sensenbrenner. I, I what I was uh, about to say is that I that I don't think that there's I, I see a basis for some difference in content. I don't see a basis for saying we have to stand behind what we're talking about and they don't have to stand behind what they're talking about. So we do think that it is uh, that, that that's quite important. And as I say, it's in our submission. Well, I, you know, I can say that looking at it from afar and relying on press reports, the uh, response of the Environment Minister of India following Secretary Clinton's visit to New Delhi and the press conference that she had there uh, certainly was not encouraging that uh, India would sign up for binding commitments. So I wish you good luck in uh, hopefully uh, getting them to realize that uh, uh, they've got to jump on board binding commitments if they expect the rest of the world to do that. Uh, the final uh, piece of questions that I'd like to ask you, Mr. Stern, is as I mentioned in my opening statement, developing countries are trying to weaken intellectual property rights. And I'm very concerned that uh, the developing countries have proposed preventing patenting and developing in, the, the, in their countries, requiring compulsory licensing, ensuring access to new technologies on a non-exclusive royalty-free term. Does the administration support any of these positions or will the administration work to make sure that the protection of intellectual property rights, which in my opinion uh, is needed to assemble the capital to develop these new technologies be included in a treaty that comes out of Copenhagen? Uh, we don't support those positions, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Uh, the, uh, I, look, I, I, think that, I think that intellectual property is, uh, is central to our system, and indeed, if you, if you look at this problem, which is the way, the way I look at it, I think the way we look at it, is fundamentally an issue that is only going to be solved with the development uh, of, uh, with, with, through innovation, with the development of new technologies uh, 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 promoted through the right rules of the road, to be sure. Uh, you can't have, you can't have a, a, a problem based on, uh, whose solution is based on innovation 
if you interfere with intellectual property rights. Now, yeah. th having said that, it is, we also have to recognize it is, it is terribly important that we, that we do find ways, con completely consistent with intellectual property protection, where we, where we seek to diffuse and disseminate technology to places yeah. that need it. But, uh, but we don't have any, we, yeah. we don't have, I don't think I have any difference in of opinion with what you've stated. That's good to hear. I yield back the balance of my time. Put while we're ahead. <laughs> thank, I, I thank the, uh, the gentleman. Um, and uh, I think it's important to note that you did work on intellectual property issues when you were on the staff of uh, Senator Leahy in the Senate. Did indeed. Yeah. Uh, let me uh, turn now and recognize the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> I think a number of us who uh, had the opportunity to spend uh, a week in China earlier this year come away with the same um, expression of optimism that you mentioned in terms of the interest in the Chinese. It was, I think, conveyed formally and informally that there was great interest in uh, securing an agreement, that it was clearly important to them. Um, and uh, the notion that there are lots of of common interests, and I'd like to return to that in a moment. But before then, I'd, I'd like to just follow up on um, your response uh, to the initial question about what's different now than the Kyoto negotiations you were involved in earlier. You mentioned that we didn't have uh, the domestic um, policy vacuum, that we have a greater uh, structural framework. I, I'm pleased that uh, after eight years of the United States being missing in action, that we've, I think, changed that and that we're working on the policy uh, framework. But I, I'm wondering if, if other than the legislation that's passed the House, if you have other thoughts about changes to that framework, like the EPA's decision that we're going to be dealing with carbon pollution uh, as, uh, um, as something that uh, is going to be subject to regulation. Are there other elements here that you see that change that framework? Well, sure. Uh, I, you know, I think that uh, that uh, the uh, I think the EPA uh, decision uh, is an important one. Uh, I think that you know, again, I I I, I see the, the general domestic backdrop. What's happening here, also with the the, the underpinning in terms of uh, of uh, of broader uh, understanding and support for the issue uh, in the public. In the national security community, uh, a greater, uh, a much greater uh, 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 involvement uh, in the business community in, in the high tech sectors, who who I think do see clean energy as you know as the way to go. I mean, I look, I, I think that 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 people who who lay their bets down on high carbon infrastructure, or high carbon production methods now. Are uh, a little bit like the like the guys who built typewriter plants on the on the dawn of the PC revolution. It's a bad bet, and so I think that there is a different I think that there is a different kind of uh, cultural infrastructure, if you will, with respect to uh, where the public is, where the business community is, where the national security community is, and where Congress is. I think all of those things are quite different, and uh, and lay the foundation for us to move forward if we can you know if we can get this right and if we can get our inter international partners uh, to move along with us. It was interesting, the business community letter to the Senate yesterday, uh, uh, reinforcing your point. Um, are there provisions uh, in the House legislation that you see specifically making a difference to bring together domestic and foreign interests uh, to be able to understand uh, mutual benefits uh, so that we're bridging that gap and making it uh, less adversarial, despite perfectly predictable negotiating posturing, but right. elements that we've done here that will help make your task easier. Uh, yes, uh, I would point to two uh, in particular. I think that, uh, that uh, and they're related, I think there are provisions uh, in the bill uh, one that involves a, a set aside for international forestry of 5% of, uh, of allowances, uh, and another that, uh, that, that uh, provides a scaling up set aside for uh, adaptation and mitigation, 5% <coughs> for each, and scales all the way up to 4% for each in the mid-2020s. 20, uh, Th those provisions are, uh, are engines for financial support 
to poor countries uh, around the world uh, and in a way that I think is, uh, is, is again, very much uh, in our interests uh, and, in the end, uh, both in our interest from a substantive standpoint and from a diplomatic standpoint of being able to, uh, to attract support. Uh, from developing countries. So I, 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 I mentioned even in my, in, in my opening remarks, I'm, I'm very hopeful that provision, those provisions or at least some facsimile thereof can be uh, maintained in, uh, in whatever the Senate, uh, in whatever uh, version of the bill comes out in the Senate, because I, I do think those are, those are quite important. Last but not least, is there anything additional from your vantage point that you think uh, the House and this committee can do in the interim between now and Copenhagen that would be useful? Well, I think, uh, uh, Congressman, I, I think that, that any time members of, uh, of Congress, uh, whether in, in this committee or in the House or the Senate, have an opportunity to speak with, uh, with uh, foreign uh, government uh, visitors on, on, on these issues, and to speak to them in a way that uh, imparts some sense of reality uh, to their thinking. Uh, that's always good. And, that's, that, and, and there's different players that that can be relevant for. That, it's important. I think that the trip that you made to China, I'm sure, uh, was, uh, was quite important in that regard. There are messages to, to be sent to uh, places like India, but also to places like Europe. I mean, the, 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 the thing that is going to allow us to get this done, if we can get it done, is, uh, is combining the sense of what science requires with the sense of pragmatism. And uh, there's often not enough pragmatism in the international arena. I mean, if people, we can get something done if it's based on what we all need. We can't get something done if it's based on what we all ideally want. There's a difference between what you need and what you want. And, uh, and if countries can focus on what their real needs are, uh, not on ideology, not on old rhetoric, if they can be sensitive to what is doable in the United States, we, I, I, I have, uh, am, am proud of what we're doing here. I think the, I think the bill that, that, uh, that, that came out of the House uh, was, a, it was a huge advance. Uh, and, you know, you, there are those who say, well, why aren't you doing five times as much as that? And it, it's important to hear messages from members up here saying, this is good, this is solid, this is an important start, this is consistent with what we need to do, and you're not going to do more than that. You're not going to get more than that. So let's get real and let's try to work, that, work this out and get it done. Okay, the gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State. In uh, Thank you. It, when we went to China, we were very impressed with their investments in new clean energy technology. And we were impressed there were things they were doing we didn't know before we went, including their renewable energy standards and the like. It's clear that they're moving. It's clear that they want to dominate some of these industries. And that's one of the reasons I'm happy our stimulus plan got us out of the gate. But I guess the question I have is, as far as an agreement with China, um, you know, they, they talked to the uh, about themselves as a, as a developing country, which was interesting because we would drive by the main drag going down to the People's Hall past Gucci stores and Lexus dealerships, Been and, there. <laughs> you know, and Prada stores, and it was difficult to understand that. And to me, it sort of looked like there was not two parts of the world, the developed world and the developing world. There were three parts, the developed world, the developing world, and China, which is some sort of third tier in its own classification. Should we think of that in these terms and encourage China to think about themselves in those terms? And if so, where do they fit in that tier? Yeah, I, I have had uh, very much the same uh, reaction driving down the same uh, road that, uh, that you did, Congressman. I, I think China is, uh, is kind of a developed and a developing country at the same time. Uh, it's, it, it is a uh, obviously, a huge economic juggernaut. When you uh, when you uh, see the big cities, they're you know gleaming skyscrapers and uh, and and very modern looking. They still have somewhere between three and four hundred million people, more people than live in this country, who live on a dollar or two a day. Uh, they're dirt poor in 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 many parts, particularly the rural parts uh, of the country. Uh, so I uh, the. the they're kind of both. They kind of are a hybrid, as as, as you say. Uh, and I think that 
that uh, we have to and are pushing China hard to take strong action. Uh, they can't be treated, you can't sort of put China in, uh, expe expect of China what you would expect of uh, poor countries in uh, Africa or Latin America or Asia. Uh, they are, they need to be treated, as do the other emerging market uh, uh, countries, uh, in a way that requires uh, real action, because it's the only way to, to, to solve the problem. And over time, and I don't think a very long period of time, I think they're going to need to be treated just exactly the same as developed countries, but we're not quite, we're not quite there yet. Um, I, I will say that, um, that if you look at what China is, is doing it, on, on this issue, it's actually quite uh, it's quite impressive. It's not adequate yet, but uh, they're doing a lot. And I, I have sometimes said that I think the real competitiveness issue for us, the real competitiveness issue for us, is that we might think we're going to spend the next five years pushing China, and then we're going to spend all the rest of the years chasing them if we don't get our own act together. Because they're moving, they see big markets, and they're going to and they're going to and they're going to move if, if we don't. Uh, you know, I think all of our anxiety has been that China is not moving on global climate change. Our economic anxiety should be that they are moving on climate well, change I, because they want to dominate these industries, and we right. ought to be players in this. And right. I'm glad the administration and we've worked I'll to, look at to electric some success. Vehicles and look at what they just right. announced on the solar front, which is great. We need that to happen, but we need to be in the game fully ourselves. Right. I think our bill uh, will help in that regard. Yes. Um, we talked to Prime Minister Singh of India a couple years ago, and he. Uh, told us, and I don't think he was joking when he said this, he says, you know, India has agreed or will agree to a binding target of CO2 emissions. We will agree never to exceed per capita, per capita, the average of industrialized nations' right. emissions. They've sort of said, sure, we'll agree with you. We'll agree never to emit more than you do. We will agree to a binding target. Now, of course, if they get to that level, the planet will be cooked long ago. Um, what do we say to that argument, and what is it in regard to India that we expect? Uh, well, we, we, we uh, say to the argument that, uh, that obviously that that's not good enough. It, it is the case that as we, if you think about the, the trajectory of, uh, of the bill that came out of the House, the per capita emissions of the United States are going to decline very significantly over a period of 40 years or so, if you take this out to 2050. So the disparity... If we pass our bill. That's right. If the Senate, <laughs> the Senate, uh, <laughs> Senate passes a bill and we get a conference and the President can sign it and we actually enact legislation, which again, I think is, there's nothing more important than that. But, uh, but, it, but, but if, if, if that kind of uh, regime gets put in place, uh, you're going to have a you're going to have a gap between uh, between uh, the per capita emissions of countries like India and countries like and like us uh, dramatically decrease because of the efficiencies uh, and the renewable uh, energy development and so forth that uh, that will be part and parcel of of that legislation. But uh, in terms of what we're looking for from India now, it's very much the same structure as what I said for China. They need to articulate a strong, a robust set of actions that are going to reduce their emissions significantly from where they would otherwise be, from their business as usual. They've got to reflect those uh, in an international agreement, and exactly what the structure of that is is, is very, a very live part of the discussions and negotiations. There's got to be a verification uh, system. I mean, it goes under the rubric of MRV, Measurement Reporting and Verification, but verification is really the, the most important piece so that everybody can see what everybody else is doing and have some level of confidence that, you know, when China or India or, or, or France or anybody else says we're going to do X, there's a, there's a system to see whether they've actually done X. Uh, and then there's got to be, there's got to be, there's got to be a, a mechanism for financing and uh, technology dissemination. And I think those are the key issues, and we're working with them on, uh, on all of those issues. And India is difficult. I mean, there's no question about it. India is tough. Thank you. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Stern, the, the, the world is in the throes of the Great Recession, and, and I think there are some uh, European nations that are already experiencing some uh, uh, relief, uh, uh, and the, there, of course, is concern that, the, that we could pull people back down into 
uh, a, 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 a much a greater recession if we don't recover. Uh, last year, the UN uh, suggested uh, that uh, $86 billion a year would be needed uh, to provide aid to developing nations uh, as we you know, began to try to clean up this planet. My, my concern, uh, and, and perhaps you've, you've uh, thought about it or, or maybe even had some discussion about it, uh, at this point, uh, the, the, the um, UN has collected uh, nothing. And uh, given the, the state of economics around the globe, is there a concern on your part that if we uh, are successful in Copenhagen, uh, uh, but demonstratively cannot provide money. I mean, we have people in the United States who, who, do, who, who, who object to paying the UN dues. Uh, so when we um, are, are asked to provide money uh, for this and we, we run into problems at home, does that create a uh, cause for China and India uh, to uh, become even more uh, resistant uh, to uh, participation, to, the participa to their participation, since we're not putting any money forth, therefore we must not be serious? Uh, it's a very good question, Congressman, and an important question. Um, let me say a couple of things about it. First of all, the, uh, it, it's going to be important that there be uh, financing assistance uh, at some level provided, particularly, particularly to poor countries. It is also true, as Mr. Sensenbrenner said uh, in, in his remarks, that, that the kinds of numbers that are, that are tossed around by, uh, by uh, some in, uh, in the negotiations are completely wildly unrealistic. I mean, 1 percent of GDP, things like that, which are, uh, are, uh, are untethered to reality. Uh, we have to work with uh, the EU, Japan, uh, Australia, other, de other developed countries to, uh, to, uh, to develop a, uh, a uh, overall financing package which uh, is consistent with, uh, with kind of what we can do. Uh, again, this is, a, this is an agreement that would, that would kick in starting in 2013, so uh, hopefully we are going to be uh, out of the Great Recession and into a, uh, into a uh, better period of growth by that time. But, but the amounts of money have to be uh, that, are, that, are, uh, uh, that, are, that are considered and that ultimately get agreed to have to be, have to be uh, have to have to strike a right balance to what what is uh, what's reasonable to, to provide, and uh, on the one hand, and and uh, and it's con and that's uh, consistent with, uh, or at least gets us in the right direction uh, with respect to the need. Uh, on the other side, uh, again, I, I think that the the provisions that are in the Waxman Markey Bill are are really quite helpful in that regard because they do generate some funds, not vast amounts, but but a good start. <coughs> Through uh, through the sale of uh, of emission allowances, and so that's I think a, a good way to do it. Uh, that's not it doesn't have to get into the you know yearly appropriations kind of process. Uh, but this is this is a this is this is a, a need that's going to scale up over time, and we just have to kind of step in a balanced and reasonable way along with our developed country partners so that we're making a good start, but but it's affordable. Do, do you think that it would be important for the, I mean, the, as of today, the, the, we don't even have any administrative cost, uh, w which does not bode well for uh, at least, I think, the picture that, that, uh, that we need to paint of, of um, what uh, is going to happen after Copenhagen. I mean, we, we, uh, I think administrative costs have been estimated at about $4 billion, and, and of course we have nothing on that. Uh, I do agree. Uh, that Marky Waxman does provide some 
some help. The problem, I mean, and maybe you can help us with this, we need a unicameral system of government here in the United States or either, uh, so we can close down the Senate uh, either today or, or after, uh, you know, sometimes before Christmas. I think that, that you know, w the House has already acted. Uh, and my, my, we're three months away from Copenhagen, so I think it would be important either to close the Senate down or somehow get them to, to do something they don't like to do, which is uh, vote on legislation. Uh, um, do, do you agree with me? <laughs> no, no comment. <laughs> I'm appearing before the Senate in a week or two, so I'm, uh, I, I, and I worked in the Senate. I'm a, I'm a big fan of both bodies. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I yield back to the House. I managed to grow up in Chicago and like the White Sox and the Cubs, so I'm not going to get into <laughs> Great. Gentlemen's time has expired. Um, the Chair will recognize himself again for additional questions. Uh, inside of the Waxman-Markey bill are individual provisions on uh, renewable electricity standards for our country, energy efficiency standards for our country. How do uh, individual complementary policies like that included in the legislation um, play a role in global agreements on play role play a role what role would provisions like that adopted by the United States play in uh, international negotiations right. on the responsibility of countries around the world to adopt similar provisions well, I, look, I think I think provisions like that are uh, are very important for both for both substantively and uh, and actually diplomatically. I mean, substantively because they they uh, they can push us a good uh, in in the, in the direction of of taking concrete action to reduce emissions uh, and uh, as well as uh, improving our overall uh, economic and clean energy uh, profiles. I think those are all they're, they're important for that reason. Uh, in addition. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, there, there are different kinds of ideas that are being discussed right now with respect to what the structure of this agreement ought to, ought to look like. One of, the, one, of the, one of the ideas, I think it's actually quite, a, quite an interesting one, has uh, been proposed by uh, Australia, sort of sim something similar by South Korea, a little bit different, uh, which would contemplate countries uh, uh, ent entering their, uh, their uh, commitments, their policies, onto a schedule, sort of like in a trade context, uh, and, uh, and committing to, uh, to carry them out. Uh, so I think that, that uh, in, a, in a structure like that, which again, we, we do find interesting, uh, you could imagine uh, putting in our, uh, all of our uh, critical policies uh, and what they add up to. Uh, and, uh, and I think that, that in doing that, we would, we, it would gives us the opportunity, and, and, uh, and I think, pushes countries not only to have a number, but to say, you know, not just X percent, but here's how we're going to do it. Here's what we're going to do about it. We've got a policy on renewable energy standards and, uh, and appliances and a cap and trade system, and, you know, we're putting our money where our mouth is, and so should you. So I think it's useful in that regard. Uh, can you talk about the, the sharing of technical know-how and expertise in uh, emissions verification processes as we're going. How would that work? What, what, how do you envision um, the sharing of the expertise to occur and ensuring that there is, in fact, a verification system in place that would work? Well, there's two, there, there, there's two different, uh, there's a couple of different elements to that. There's a, there's a measurement and reporting piece of that. The, measure, the, the measurement in, in particular uh, is, uh, is, a, is a piece of that where I think that the, the technical expertise of countries like the United States will be important in helping various countries, uh, in, in, actually even China, uh, to, 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 be, uh, to uh, have greater capacity to measure emissions in a, you know, in a, in a credible way. Uh, verification is, uh, as we see it, fundamentally an issue of trying to uh, establish the countries are actually doing uh, what they've said that they're going to do. And there are this is a this is a discussion which is uh, which is live and going on in the in the negotiations uh, right now. I mean, I think that uh, that that it will need to uh, a, a verification system to work is going to have to balance rigor with. Uh, not being overly intrusive because uh, 
countries like us and other countries will have uh, uh, concerns about the degree to which you know people swoop in from uh, from outside. So there's 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 got to be a good balance in how that's done, and we're working on that. And in, in, in your opinion, is it possible to develop a verification regime yes. which can accurately measure emissions reductions without having an overly intrusive uh, system put yeah, I, th I think it, I think I think that it is, uh, Mr. Chairman. I mean, I think that I think that the, the again the measurement part uh, is something that uh, that we have a lot of expertise in. Other developed countries do, uh, and we can help uh, in what's uh, often referred to as capacity building, so that uh, so that uh, countries uh, that have less expertise actually uh, can go about effectively measuring emissions. So that's one piece of it. <coughs> The verification piece also has to do with uh, the degree to which if uh, if country says we're going to do X, Y, and Z, they can demonstrate that they're actually doing it. Uh, and I think that there's uh, some of that is going to is going to is, is going to depend uh, in the first instance on what countries report. There's going to there likely need to be some sort of expert review from the outside. I mean, there's a there's a there's a there's a suite of elements that are going to have to be part of that. And uh, I think it will be tricky. But I think it's very important. It is important, uh, uh, very important. Uh, so, for example, if if we were looking at the steel sector in China, in the United States, and in India, and we wanted to make sure that that sector was properly verified, um, would an agreement be reached as part of this uh, ultimate treaty that would put in place a verification system that would be mutually agreed upon by those countries? Uh, uh, if you just give us uh, using well, that as a specific give me, using steel as a specific example, could you walk through how that might? Unfold? Yeah, I, well, I think I think it I think it depends in the first instance on what the actions are that a country agrees to undertake. So let's assume on, on your hypothetical that China has agreed to to, to do X Y Z things with respect to the steel uh, industry. Then I think uh, that uh, that it would first of all be important to. Work with the Chinese to uh, to uh, make sure they're capable of measuring uh, the emissions uh, in a reasonably accurate way, uh, and then I think it would be some combination uh, of uh, of reporting in the first instance, and this can be true for any country, the United States or anybody else. In the first instance, reporting by the country saying right, we agreed to do the following things: we're going to have you know this, that, or the other kind of uh, of uh, of uh, of policies apply to uh, steel mills or the building of steel mills or the running of steel mills in China. Here's what we said we were going to do. Here's what we're doing. And then uh, I think a, a capacity would be uh, essential to have some kind of out, outside uh, expert uh, review to be able to look to see what uh, what's being represented uh, and uh, and uh, you know and determine whether it whether. It, uh, whether it's accurate. The gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Mr. Stern, um, on June 10th, you were quoted in the China Daily as, quote, we don't expect China at this stage to take on a national cap. Um, you've been advocating for the national cap in the Waxman-Markey bill. Why is the cap good for us and not good for China? Well, look. I I think it would be great if China took on a national cap. I don't think that's the only way to go. And again, I think that, uh, as I said, as I said earlier, China. When I'm talking to to uh, Mr. Inslee, China is in a kind of hybrid position. China is uh, is uh, obviously a develop a developing juggernaut. It's got a very powerful economy. It's also still, in many respects, developing. So it's it's somewhere it's somewhere in between. And uh, I think that what we need to get from China is, uh, is are a, a set of actions that are strong. Now, look, look at what they have, you know, what they're currently doing uh, right now uh, in, includes a 20% uh, cut in their energy intensity. Uh, I think that uh, that is something that's actually economy-wide. It's not a cap in the same way that we're talking about, uh, but it's significant. Uh, I think that, uh, and they have uh, a, uh, they've got a 15 percent by 2020 renewable energy standard. They've got vehicle standards that are uh, pretty much comparable to ours. Uh, they've got uh, a whole suite of other measures uh, for uh, efficiency and the like. It's not, 
I mean, on the one hand, it's, it's significant and it's doing a fair amount. On the other hand, they're growing so fast that their emissions are still going up a lot. Uh, they need to do a set of policies that add up to a national reduction in their emissions, right? Uh, so uh, that's, that's the thing that we're most fundamentally interested in. If they did a national cap, that would be great. I don't think they're going to do that yet. Uh, and I think that we don't, I don't think it's crucial for us that that happen as long as there's a set of policies that add up to a real uh, reduction. Uh, compared to uh, see, I'm concerned that the Chinese are taking advantage of the differentiated language in the Bali agreement, uh, basically to cook the math in their favor. Um, uh, the Chinese economy is recovering from the worldwide recession faster than ours. Maybe that's because their stimulus package uh, uh, was more effective than the ones that uh, uh, we have employed. Uh, but the projection that I've heard is that the Chinese GDP will go up by about 50 percent from 2005 to 2010. Now, a 20 percent cut in uh, uh, energy intensity means that they still emit 30 percent more in emissions, and uh, that certainly is not going to have the economic impact that the uh, caps in the Waxman-Markey bill are going to impose on the United States. And uh, the Bert Hagel resolution uh, basically said the Senate wouldn't ratify a treaty unless it meet, met two points. One is, is that it was worldwide in application, and secondly, that it didn't hurt the United States economy. And if we're reducing our emissions below where we are now, and China is still allowed to increase it, its emissions by 30 percent, uh, I just can see more wealth and more jobs being outsourced from the United States to China. And uh, that's not anything that I'm willing to support. I don't think the American public will support it either. So how do we deal with this issue? Well, I. Uh uh, Congressman, I think that the that uh, that what we have to the, what we have to keep our eye on is uh, is again the the uh, robustness of the Chinese program. And I think in the in the right circumstances, and we don't know what we've got yet, but in the right circumstances, what you'd like to see is a set of actions that uh, where they are reducing emissions compared to their business as usual path which is at least in some broad way uh, comparable to or in the range of comparability with what we're talking about. Uh, and I think that's, I think that's, I think that's possible. Uh, now, we don't, we don't have that yet. We don't know yet, but that's, but that's what we're pushing toward. I mean, there, again, the reductions that, they've, that they have been making over this five-year period, they're not enough, but they're actually fairly significant as compared to where they would otherwise be. And that, and that again, is, uh, is I think, what we still need to be focusing on. But, the, but other thing, the other thing, just with respect to, to, uh, to our own uh, concerns about our own uh, companies is that, that the legislation that was passed out of the House uh, includes a good deal of protection for uh, energy-intensive, trade-exposed in industries, basically getting, uh, getting all uh, allowances relating to this legislation free so that those industries aren't going to pay any more uh, into the 2020s. They're not going to pay any more. So it's, not, it's not a case that, that you've, got, you've got this trade exposed industry and they're going to pay so much because of this bill and the Chinese aren't. They're not going to pay. But, you know, with, with all due respect, Mr. Stern, you know, boiling the math down to the bottom line, meaning when you push the equals button on the calculator, what the Chinese say they're doing is they're cutting back on the growth rate of their emissions so that they'll still be 30 percent above 2005 levels, whereas Waxman-Markey says that we have to reduce our emissions to 17 percent below a lower baseline. And that math just doesn't add up. And uh, I, I think that, that my constituents and the Senate ultimately will have to view whether the deal is a good one for the United States and is in our national interest. Right. And China going up 30 percent and us going down 17 percent with different baselines, in my opinion, uh, flunks the good deal test uh, by a long, long way. So I just urge you that you're going to have to figure out a way to figure out uh, how to bridge the gap between plus 30 and minus 17. Well, I, 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 I appreciate your, uh, your views, Congressman. Uh, I, I, I do think that, that with respect to, uh, to 
the, the world broadly with respect to, to the major developing countries, uh, a very important issue is one actually which is uh, referenced in the Leaders' Declaration uh, from the Major Economies Forum, uh, although not with a year specified yet, but that emissions are going to have to peak. They are not going to peak next year for China. They are just not. I mean, you can't take an economy that is growing like that and, and, and put the brakes on flat. I mean, if you look at if you look at what the trajectory is for China, it is completely different from the, than the trajectory for the developed world. So you can't quite expect that. On the other hand, you can expect that over uh, a, you know, a, 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 uh, an appropriate period of time, emission, the emissions growth slows, they peak, and then they start coming down. When that, what that time is is going to be an important part of the discussion. Great. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State. I almost think before um, we have a Senate debate on a treaty, everybody has to watch Slumdog Millionaire and just get a sense of what we are dealing with with some of our fellow, um, fellow folks across the water. I, I want to just ask, what's, if we had two scenarios, which one would be better for the United States? One scenario where India, let's say those people who are now living with a piece of plastic stretched over their head on a piece of bamboo and maybe one shirt to their name, and they wake up in the morning and try to figure out where they're going to get water. And when you talk to those people, that's what they say. What's the first thing you do? You get up when you wake up. You said, I try to find some water to drink. Then maybe I try to find some food to eat. And there's 300 to 500 million of those people live that way. Now we're and you know we're going to asking them. They need to act. But the question is what. So here's two scenarios. One scenario where those folks agree to a cap of the same cap that we have in the United States per person. They agree with us. They will never emit more than we will today. And they will agree to be built, bound by, by Waxman Markey in a sense. But of course, their emissions would go up by a factor of 10 per person if they did that. They would still agree to a cap, but it wouldn't do us any good or a situation where we demand and receive vigorous investments by them, vigorous changes in their regulatory structure, vigorous changes in their transportation infrastructure, vigorous efficiency standards in their building, some of which some of them have done. Of those two scenarios, my view would be a, an agreement where we win agreements by the developing world to take action, including China, as opposed to a cap, which might be so high that they never actually ever do anything until the world is already destroyed. I will take the action rather than the cap. What are your thoughts I on that? I completely agree, uh, Congressman, and that is very much consistent with, uh, with our focus all through this year. It is consistent with the focus in our submission. It is consistent with the focus of what we are going to be discussing in the Major Economies Forum next week here in Washington. Uh, so I couldn't agree with you more. Well, thank you. There's two of us anyway. That's a start. Thanks a lot. Great. Thank you. Well, um, this has been an extremely informative, helpful um, briefing, Mrs. Stern. We appreciate it very much. What I'd like to do is give you a couple of minutes, if you'd like, to summarize your your case here to the Congress, what you think that we should do, and uh, what your expectations are for Copenhagen uh, in terms of the results for our country and for the planet. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate um, the opportunity to uh, have come before you today. Uh, look, I think that the most important thing, without a doubt, for the Congress to do is to enact legislation, pass legislation, and send it to the President that can be uh, that he can sign uh, that uh, that uh, puts a. a uh, that, that gives us the kind of credibility and leverage that, that, uh, that would be enormously useful in the context of these negotiations. So in terms of what can Congress do, there's obviously a lot of things Congress can do, but that's, that's, that's job number one uh, as, far as, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, we are going to be working hard through this fall to press our case with all of the critical parties, the, and that includes uh, the Europeans, the uh, the non-EU developed countries like Japan and Australia, Canada, others, uh, the major developing countries like China, India, Brazil, South Africa, and then the kind of rank and file of, if you will, of, uh, of developing countries. 
uh, we need to make a case that, uh, and I think that, that increasingly countries see this, that this is an absolutely critical priority uh, for the world, that, that there are security, economic, and environmental consequences of not acting that are just not acceptable. I mean, the status quo is not sustainable. Uh, and we have a moment here where we can make uh, real progress. Uh, so we have to get our own house in order uh, as, a, as a priority, uh, and we have to work with our developed country friends and then developing uh, to, uh, to frame out a system that people can all agree on. I think it should be built on countries, uh, uh, countries committing to uh, a set of their own national actions. I mean, that's what we've been talking about from the beginning, and that's what we think is most effective. It, it's got to have that. It's got to have a verification system, and there's got to be a reasonable and balanced uh, system for, uh, for supporting, uh, the, uh, through financing and technology, poor countries around the world. Uh, it's also important, I think, and we, uh, we have been doing this, but, but we are going to redouble our efforts to, to make sure that the broad range of developing countries, not the big ones, uh, they're in a different place. They don't actually, we're not looking for them to step up and say we're going to make midterm reductions uh, by 2020 in the following ways. What we need them to do is develop low-carbon development strategies, low-carbon growth plans. Uh, and, and if they're poor countries, then with, uh, with, uh, with technical assistance and financing support to do that, uh, so that everybody can get on a path to a low carbon uh, development and to the building of a low carbon global economy. That's the only way, that's the only way we're going to be able to, to, uh, to proceed. Uh, technology development is going to be a huge uh, part of that, but uh, we have to, we, we're going to need to move forward with all of these groups and, you know, we're going to be trying to do that at all levels. There are a num number of important uh, 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 opportunities that the President is going to have uh, this fall, the Secretary of State, of course, uh, uh, me and my team will be uh, proceeding uh, at, uh, at, at uh, full throttle and um, we're going to do our best to get this done. Well, it, was, uh, it was a real a privilege to have you uh, come before us today. Uh, we wish you the best of luck. Uh, we will do our best for, uh, from our side to work with the Senate in order to uh, complete the legislation uh, so that you can go fully armed into these negotiations. Uh, the next 90 days are critical, uh, and uh, we very much thank you for your work on behalf of our country and the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. This hearing is adjourned.